Hello and welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Piet Lanza. Listen carefully. The audience is your instrument. Play it in order to practically understand how we are generally instrumentalized. Prepare the audience with concepts, questions and movements as a way to explore the dissonance that exists between the individual narcissism that capitalism promotes and our social capacity, between how we conceive ourselves as free individuals with agency and the way that we are socially determined by capitalist relations, technology and ideology. Reflect on the I-we relation while defining social dissonance. Help the collective subject to emerge. The text that I just read is the introduction to the score to Social Dissonance, a performance staged by the artist, musician and theorist Matin at Document 14 in 2017. At the event, audiences were subjected to a series of seemingly arbitrary actions by four performers. For many participants, this experience was unsettling or destabilizing. In the course of the hour-long event, audiences were forced to repeatedly rearrange the social relations between themselves and the rest of the group. For some, this came at the cost of having to become publicly vulnerable. For others, this experience was so uncomfortable that they may have preferred to opt out. This long-term experiment by Matten is part of his application of the principles of noise performance to social relations. Noise work is often assumed to be autonomous and unencumbered by social conventions. In Social Dissonance, the book which bears the same title as the performance Matten develops an in-depth theory of alienation in the Marxist philosophical tradition. He proposes that the condition of social dissonance, one which unsettles social and material relations to the point where they are impossible to ignore, is the only way to deal with alienation. Rather than return to some pre-alienated state, as is the aim of much Marxist thought, Matten wants to confront the mechanism of alienation outright. I plan to record a perfectly streamlined interview with Matten, his book would have lent itself to this perfectly. The majority of the 200 or so pages contains perfectly well-written theory and built and well-situated history of Marxist thought. But perhaps because I wanted to talk about my experience of the performance, the interview got a little derailed in a manner that would have normally required me to edit some of the sequence. In the spirit of social dissonance, however, I decided not to do this. What you hear now is my conversation with Matten as it happened including some mildly awkward pauses and side notes. It may not make sense throughout, and it might not be the most enlightening interview that you ever hear either. I will ask, however, that you follow one of the rules of social dissonance that I remember from the performance of the documenta. If you decide to stop listening in the middle of the episode, please pause and explain to everyone, out loud, why it is that you want to leave. Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Martin, I'm super excited to talk to you. I've kind of been waiting for this conversation for five years, but I didn't necessarily know that I was. So in the previous edition, the late, last edition of Documenta in 2017, you staged a performance called Social Dissonance, which is also the title of the book we're going to discuss now. And Social Dissonance, I remember being quite shaken by. Um, I experienced it twice. Once I walked out of it in Athens, um, because um, your performers, maybe you were in the audience, I don't know whether maybe you were in the room, um, your performers made us wait for no reason for an incredibly long time, and I got a little bit impatient. But somehow when I got to encounter the same experience in the same, the same performance in Castle, which is where the documenta, the exhibition, takes place normally, um, I somehow gave into it, and I spent a wonderful hour or maybe more, locked in a room with about 20 other people, most of them on that occasion, museum curators and you know, art, world, art world people. And I was being completely bewildered by a series of exercises by your performers. I remember that we started off by trying to organize ourselves um, along a wall, from not from tallest to to, to shortest or shortest to tallest, but rather from least powerful to most powerful, or maybe least confident to most confident. Now, there's a recording of this. Well, maybe we'll get to this. Um, but I thought this was a fantastic thing. I didn't quite understand it at the time, and through sheer luck, I managed to come across the title of your book. Now, this is a very long introduction. I'm going to already have to edit it because I'm getting overexcited. 
what was it that I experienced, Matan? And who are you? What was your role in this in this in the, in this in this performance experience for me? Well, yeah, hopefully you were experiencing social dissonance, which <laughs> is the title of the book, the name of the score, and a concept which tries to describe the discrepancy that exists between certain values that are promoted in Western democracies that have to do with equality, democracy, and individual freedom. So these are the values that, you know, most of us in Western liberal societies promote, but in our everyday life, we generate we 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 reproduce a system based on inequality oppression and exploitation so this inevitably generates a massive cognitive dissonance between mm. what we think and what we do and i think that's a kind of latent thing that we all have and that through this uh, experimental situation, I call it a concert, the idea was to make this social dissonance resonate, to collectivize it, to do something with it, to put it out there in order to play with it. So the score, which the four interpreters were trying to follow, but which the also audience had access to it, was made in order for this to happen to this social dissonance to be played with. So we can try to mm. engage with what it might seem a very abstract kind of concept, but then practically, did you experience this social dissonance? Did you get a feeling of like, what, what, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure that I did in a way that would be kind of ideal. And I'm I'm going to own up to something straight away. I think I've already in 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 asking you this very complicated long question. I've already overcompensated for something I I expected might happen even in our conversation. So social dissonance, in in my words, we'll we'll get we'll get to think about it a, a little bit more in a second. Is this condition in which one is a little bit disorientated by one's surroundings and by social relationships that are playing themselves out. And I have a memory of um, positioning myself in your concert in, in the performance as someone who was overtly confident. And having read the book and having read the script a couple of days ago for the performance, I realized that you have ways of dealing with people like me by now. <laughs> And you maybe you didn't do that. Maybe you didn't have them at hand in the very early iterations of the performance. But so maybe maybe I need to shut up is what I'm going to suggest. And, okay. and let you perform some social dissonance on me by going back to the beginning. Tell me who you are. Tell me how we've got here. What what is your practice? How is it that your practice, which um I understand deals with noise and um and music? how that has led you led you to this position of playing humans as instruments well yeah i'm an improviser and i also deal with noise and in the course of my many years engaging with this context i started to understand that there was something taken for granted in this context and this was individual freedom and I think that this individual freedom is highly problematic is actually not possible to fully realize it's a very minuscule kind of possibilities you know it offers a very reduced possibilities of what you know freedom might be so then 
the question was, okay, what do we consider to be an individual? And, and that's what it took me to the concept of alienation. Uh, alienation as understood as a kind of forms of mediation and separation and the history of the concept has many, it's very charged. But what I started to understand is that this individual is mediated by, you know, different forms of alienation from language to technology to, you know, capitalist relations. There's like different, you know, forms of mediation that actually undermine that idea of the individual and its potential for freedom. So then I started to basically deal with this lack of freedom as material to be dealt with, to be improvised. Um, so then maybe the emphasis shifted, you know, from the kind of sonic material to a more direct relation mm -hmm. to other people and to engage with other people mm -hmm. and to play with interactive forms of, um, of engagement. And that's how, you know, I guess maybe with, with the help of conceptual art and, you know, different forms of theoretical frameworks and trying to be experimental and be with others in ways that is not very clearly defined and then you try to engage and break some forms of consensus or, you know, engage in different ways and then something opens up and from opening things up, then it takes you to the next step. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, and in an attempt to keep keep some control over, <laughs> over our conversation, which I'm going to, you know, actually scrap this. Um, I think it might be might be useful for for those of our listeners who haven't quite. Um, sorry, start start again. I think it would be quite useful to maybe trace the steps from the tradition of noise and noise performance and its relationship to concepts of such as freedom to take us a few steps towards the realm of contemporary art. And I don't want us to necessarily get completely bogged down into contemporary art because that's a field that has a whole range of problems. But I think what you're trying to do in social dissonance, the performance and the theorization of it that the, the book deals with for, in the most part, you move from um, a set of tools and a set of kind of liberating conceptions that the performance of noise traditionally is understood at. But you acknowledge, you observe that actually that's also something that we can no longer really rely on for a number of reasons. One, one's the fact that um, performance and, and it's sort of noise performance and its kind of freedoms have been appropriated now already into modes of productions. Um, you bring up examples like John Cage's 433, the famous piece of non-music that, that, that he produced, in which it is now, after which it is now no, no longer possible to um, consider sound not as socially constructed. So may, maybe we can take a few steps from noise into the realm of the conceptual in which noise itself is no longer no longer adequate. Well. Yeah, once again, it's, um, by taking noise, you know, like from the 70s or 80s and the form of transgressions and the things that they were replying to, um, I think they kind of propose uh, a very vitalist approach to performance and like, you know, like extreme forms of self-expression that maybe at that time were breaking taboos or breaking boundaries. Um, and then, you know, they were also offering different frequencies 
um, you know, engagements with material which were perhaps uh, disorientating for the listeners. But mm. all these became tropes, very recognizable tropes, where then it no longer kind of challenged or disturbed the the listener or, or or the public, but it actually it was expected, it was actually anticipated, it was treated as yeah. you know good quality sounds, you know. So there is a kind mm -hmm. of process of formalization or of um, of becoming palatable material uh, and so palatable sonic material. And, and I guess for me, it was that, you know, I guess the disturbant elements of it, which somehow I always thought they were reflections of the disturbance in society that interested me. But then what I came to realize is that you don't need to go to music to go to that, you know, to find those disturbances you can find them in our own everyday life, you know, and that's where yeah. I went from an understanding of noise in this extreme sonic realm into trying to understand the noise in this uh, psychological sense. And that, that's where the social dissonance comes. So there is already, you know, we embodied, you know, that disturbance um, from a promise of this system uh, give us, you know, this possibility of freedom, whatever that might be, and, you know, that, or more specifically, individual freedom, and that, you know, impossibility to do fully realize. So this generates a form of mental noise, uh, which I think, yeah, it became my material. It became my material in order to explore uh, to undermine some of those assumptions which, you know, noise historically has uh, proposed or, you know, or, yeah, these expressions of transgression, you know. It's, uh, so, so then it's like, okay, uh, when those expressions of transgressions are just a masquerade for actually, you know, forms of extreme individualism, which are the ones promoted, uh, by this system, then what do you do? And then you start to kind of see things in reverse, or, you know, you see certain inversions, you know, what you consider to be these acts of freedom, then they actually might be also read as actually very conservative, uh, yeah. you know, promoting certain conservative agendas. And like, so... I hope this helped a bit to understand that my transition from one scene to mm. this other. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I might make that the first question. I might might move it to the to the, to the beginning because I think okay. it's a good it will be will be a, a good, good way to introduce the listeners to yeah to 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 where we are. Okay, maybe maybe we can we can think a little bit about the meat of of the concert and rather than to. To rely so much on on my experience of it, which was just one out of I think 167 performances, or in fact maybe Indeed. maybe many many more, because because they were doubled up over 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 some some period. Yeah. Um, without wishing to without wishing to maybe describe too much of this for for listeners, in, instead maybe what I offer is I I put a link in the show notes to. The video recording of that performance I was in just just which, and which one were you pretty much at the top of the confident people or the powerful people? Or I think not? yeah, I was. It was me and another museum director. I made myself more powerful than her, more confident than her. So you were at the top of this. Uh... Of course, of course, I was, Martin. Of course, I'm. I'm. I'm going to. I'm going to let listeners, um, if they so desire, look at what which the video just to assure assure kind of you know complete humiliation of me as a subject in this if it didn't happen in the performance that i can i can be broken right now um but I, I, all I, what i want to say is that would you propose for your for performance as you mentioned before you propose a whole sis, a whole range of devices by which various social relationships can be 
undermined and destabilized in sometimes subtle but sometimes quite overbearing ways you know instructions you know making people wait and these are these are these are kind of things that contemporary art has experimented with as much as noise has experimented with its sonic um relationships and just just i'm going to read one of them um one of your possible devices instructions just so the listeners get some of the absurdity of it um squirrel when you don't know what to do pretend to be a squirrel that's not that's going to be my motto but this is maybe one of the kind of slightly sillier ones of, of quite a serious score so i have a couple of questions that that come out of uh come out of this one is the um the role of repetition um i've never really hung out with noise people that much in my in my life but i i know that it's it's a repetitive activity to a certain extent it's a practice that one has to maintain and keep on developing in a way that requires certain kind of aesthetic attunement in social the, the concept social dissonance in documenta also took took place over 160 odd days which meant that you could refine it but you could refine it as a performance as opposed to you couldn't refine your material you couldn't refine your instruments because the people the audiences the participants were different every single time so in the two things the repetition and the kind of aesthetic tropes that you already alluded to how how do they relate to to one another what does the form of performance of a concert allow for the development of of the project and maybe well, underneath it there's a question who who is this being produced for who ends up gaining whatever knowledge and emancipatory potential is is alluded to here is it the performance is it the audiences is it you yeah, because of the scale of it is so big uh or there is there was so much time 180 hours um i think it contains it it depends of how much you focus on a specific either a specific session or your personal experience or you can take all this material and depending on the engagement and the interest you might have well there is certainly a lot of rich material there to engage with so the repetition well simply has to do with I've, i guess i was trying to take the most out of the conditions that i was given so but understanding that this performance is quite intense so okay one hour every day seems to be kind of fine and then it's funny that you know whether it's a rec- repetition or a continuation you know uh, because we never actually mm. Every day was different, you know, every day, you know, yeah. it was like a threat, you know, so it was like a kind of continuous threat of things for, for the people who were following it, you know. Uh, so there is repetition in the framework, but not in the way that we dealt with it, because when we started, when the interpreters started, you know, to play the audience as an instrument was definitely new to them. And like, you know, if you start to play without no, any knowledge of mm. an instrument, imagine the guitar or something, you just do it quite roughly, like really, you know. And that's what we were doing at the beginning with the audience. It was pretty rough, you know. We didn't know how to engage in you know we we had to learn we had to learn how to go about it and with time you understood we understood that the most important thing was to just have minimal proposals or structures or instructions so things get going you know and then once things going then it's the audience playing themselves then also playing the interpreters you know things just kind of roll yeah. but it took a while to so it was definitely a learning process, but I guess it was that kind of repetitive structure that allowed that learning process to improve. Um, 
And in terms of form, what do you mean? Like, you know, like what's the second point that you want to... I think, I think the question of aesthetics comes in quite quite yeah. strongly. And it's something that you address in the book. And and actually the presentation of, of your work within Documenta, which is, you know, un until this, this recent edition this year, what was a place in which one could go and see what is happening in the world's aesthetics. You know, we have this... It, it's it's definitely a place where the art world comes and thinks it knows what things look like. But you've um, also been critical of of aesthetic tropes, of course, and in, in, in noise production and its tradition. So, so I'm in, I'm interested in how one undoes these things in a in a performance environment. Um, I don't know if it's and I I guess you know I remember like a noise musician saying that. I just want to take the listener into the woods, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and then I was thinking, well, actually everyday reality is much more strange than the woods and whatever, you know, it's, it's, yeah. there is something yeah, very, very strange. So it's almost an inverse relation in which by, Using the excuse of aesthetics, you have a experimental framework, temporal framework, where you can engage with people that you might not know and talk or deal with your own self-conception and in relationship to others. So it's almost like engaging, you know, in a kind of very prefabricated setup engaging with with you as material basically you know like kind of okay and not only you but like a kind of collective self-reflection on how we relate to each other or who we think we are and that is done understanding that there is also a process of aestheticization, you know. Uh, even though this might not be usually considered as music, or not many people consider it as music, but there mm -hmm. are sounds. There is, you know, there is forms of, maybe at the moment, they are not aesthetically totally validated. Uh, but, you know, or, you know, performatively. So it's, I guess what I take from noise is to look or to, break the hierarchies of aesthetic value, you know? So actually to say, it doesn't matter whether this is formally interesting or not, you know? This noise contains something uh, rich and I'm gonna commit to that richness. And this is a mm -hmm. kind of the social no noise that I'm trying to explore, you know? Uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to decipher this noise, you know, that's, you know, maybe this has to do with, okay, the scale, you know, some people might get something, some people, people got frustrated, some people actually, you know, I got very different, sorry, it got many different reactions, you know, but there is also this whole archival material that is actually made to be processed and that will take years and, you know, I would love to have a group of people coming from different disciplines in which we try to, you know, digest or try to make sense of what it was, because at the very least it was a portrait of a specific time, you know, the height of globalization, you know, um, pre-pandemic, you know. Yeah. So it's an amazing portrait that I think it has, uh, it could give us quite a lot of clues of, you know, like maybe psychological unconscious of how, you know, behave the way we behave, but it will need some kind of dealing with it slowly and with time. So, mm. so I, I think at the moment it's resting in this in between area where, you know, not many people is interested in this material, They're, you know, maybe with the book, some interest arises and I guess I slowly wait for the right situation to come to actually 
digest all this material, which then it will make maybe the project more complete. All right, that's, that's, that's an interesting timeline you've just proposed here, Martin. We've, we've had five years. This is the, the timeline of documenters. Um, as as you, you were saying this, I've just realized that it's quite possible that many of our listeners have still no idea what we're talking about, what this performance concept looked like. And I think at the risk of having fallen into a trap that you didn't even need to set for me, I think I think we should continue this interview with this kind of socially dissonant, dissonant way. I think I'm going to, having just said a moment ago that I'm going to edit something, cut it, move it. I think I'm going to even leave that in and I'm going to not edit this conversation. I'm going to let us go and I'm going to ask our listeners to, listeners to stick with it in the same way that you were asking your participants, audiences to stick with your concert without necessarily telling them what they were in for. Um, but I am going that's to try because, to... Uh, that, that, that's, sorry to interrupt you, but that's because <laughs> I'm also trying to make sense out of it. You know, it's, it's a very, un, you know, it's a, a slippery. It's very slippery. It's constantly falling. Like sometimes you think you have a bit of a very awareness of what this, this is about. And then it's just like hmm. the slipping through, you know, what the fuck is, this? what is this about? You know, what's... No, but, but, this is brilliant, but Martin, look, I don't want to just, just, just for those of our listeners who really need to be held by the hand and reassured, I'm holding in my hand a, a book that's over 200 pages and most of the 200 pages are, are quite, quite, quite well written, dense theory with footnotes. And we are going to talk about this in a moment. But all of it seems to relate in a way that I think is quite rare in a writing by an artist when it connects to, to a project. It all connects to this, 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 a, this experience that for me happened to come five years before I, I was aware of the book's existence. Now, to, to start asking you some technical or theoretical questions, we, we talked a moment ago about the role of the audience as an instrument and i was thinking about this kind of knowledge system like i did ask you about this as well a moment ago like who who learns who who benefits from this project but actually i think this is the this is a very utilitarian kind of naive question to a certain extent this is a question that the unreformed me the predestined me would have been asking at the <laughs> at the experience itself but you talk about this kind of social richness and the potential of these relationships in which you, one doesn't necessarily know whether, when, whether one is being, has kind of this, this dissonance imposed on them or whether one is actually embodying it. And this is a, long, a really long way to start asking you about the various meanings of alienation that the, the book in its theoretical part um, deals with. Um, Maybe, maybe just let, let, let's maybe start in this kind of very superficial understanding of, of alienated labor from Marx, which I think most, most people will be aware of. And then let's start building, building this to, to understand how you use that concept to, to, to analyze or maybe build these, these relationships in, in space. Yeah, so alienated labor is a concept by marx that proposes especially in the 1844 manuscripts and starts to suggest how uh, the worker is alienated in different forms uh, in the labor process so it's alienated from its own Katunsbesen, or species being, you know, which is what mm -hmm. is supposed to be, you know, like the capacity for sociability uh, of the human, uh, which then this is a problematic terminology specific, but it's also alienated from uh, nature uh, in this uh, process, it's also alienated uh, from the fellow workers and yeah, it's, so there is like these different forms of, um, and from himself, you know, it also alienates, you know, from 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 his own possible, you know, productivity, because the product that he produces is not for for their their own purposes. So that's a kind of early stage um, 
of the concept of the way the concept of alienation Marx used it. Then later on, he started to develop other categories. You know, he started to understand that, you know, while, you know, early on he was discussing the way that the human was separated from, you know, uh, the labor process and the system. Well, when he started to do an analysis of capital and look, you know, and develop these categories such as value, you know, and then the wage relationship and, you know, then it is like the concept of the human uh, loses importance. And, and then, you know, you were mentioning before the uh, talk about Marx's Stirner. And I think that this, mm-hmm. the whole concept of alienation was very important, you know, for Hegel, but then also for the left Hegelians, that was a group after the math of Hegel, that they were very much discussing, you know, what does this alienation mean? Because for Hegel, it is a necessary, you know, part of self-consciousness, you know, this separation, you know, that you need that level of separation for the dialectical process to kick in. So it kind of makes uh, the spirit guys, you know, to move forward. You needed this, but that is a kind of uh, form of alienation uh, in thought or in self-consciousness. Then, you know, uh, far back brings us to the question of religion in the way and the way that we separate ourselves in this process of alienation by projecting human qualities into God. And then, you know, others criticize Faulbach by thinking, you know, like, so then, you know, how that he did have this concept of the Gattungsbess and the, you know, this essence of right. human was separated by this belief in God. And then Max Stirner comes, you know, very influenced by Hegelian and says like, okay, your idea of the human is an abstraction, which is separated from the particularities of the I, you know, like the I is, mm. you know, the, 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 the ego or, you know, the, the unique one, you know, it's like, that's so particular that is not separation that that's not, you know, like that's, you know, that's not alienated, you know, so it's like, there yeah. was all these many discussions and actually Marx read Max Stirner book and said, no, no, your idea of the ego, the unique one, you know, the Einzige, that's an abstraction, you know, that's mm-hmm. a historical, you know, that, that, you know, so that's when he started to leave behind his concept of the human and then like trying to focus more on, okay, we are engaging in our own self reproduction in the capitalist form of relations. And through that, you know, certain categories, concepts, and ideas start to emerge, you know. But, you know, and these abstractions are, you know, are produced by us in our own engagement uh, with this system. So I think since, you know, alienation is an you know, a result of modernity. And it definitely implies that we don't know what we are. You know, it is yeah. it is like a way of having to deal with, you know, we it's up for grabs to know what we are. There is no essence. There is no way back to some, you know, a harmonious relation to nature. There is, you know, like, it's totally up to us to define what we are. And inevitably, this is, a full encounter with alienation. If you leave behind some, you know, religious worldviews that make a place for you, a placeholder for you to, you know, then you have to deal with alienation. And I think Marx has, you know, one of the most sophisticated understandings of how alienation works in the capitalist mode of production. So, yeah, that's, I hope, Explains. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's clear. And and just just to 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 give credit to the book, all all these all these ideas that you just 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 gave us a kind of a, a run through are, are beautifully and in a lot of detail developed in the book. And I think one of your main contentions is that the the comp- contemporary debates on the meaning and the construction of alienations are actually at a bit of a stalemate, and that that some of the 
problems of the left seem to stem from the fact that um, this particular debate has run into an, an, a couple, in couple, couple of dead, dead ends. And, and maybe that has even created some space for people like Sterner to come back on the horizon and to propose quite alluring alternatives for some right-wing positions, like you know, the aspects of libertarianism that reinforce some of the more damaging aspects of the alienated neoliberal subject that actually take it to an extreme. So the way I understand your theoretical pro project, and, and I connect it, I think, quite instinctively, having experienced the performance, having read the book, is that you try to construct an alternative understanding of alienation. And you insist that, these alien, that this understanding needs to be needs to be performed, needs to be lived, because it's not possible to avoid alienation, as you were saying, like we can't go back to some kind of un unencumbered, un you know, natural relationship to the world that, that doesn't really exist, at least not under our conditions. So what are the conditions under which um, under which we can we can think about alienation again. I mean, we don't necessarily have to think about the term alienation, but we have to, you, you've proposed putting us through a set of experiences that somehow make the possibility of, of understanding the alienating mechanisms. Well, in fact, I, I'll let you use whichever terms you need because there's, there's quite, you know, there's quite a, quite a few terms you propose in the book, estrangement, reification, some of which come from you, some of which come from other thinkers. How, how yeah. do we develop this in practice? Well, I mean, what are the way the easiest way that I will put it is to try to engage in aesthetics has historically, and I think it still has a lot of potential to offer forms of estrangement, you know, like experimental laboratory types of situations mm -hmm. where, you know, in everyday life, we need to perform a kind of confident I, you know, and as you said, you yeah. do it very well, you know, like, <laughs> but there's many people that, you know, we don't, you know, some mm. days better than others, but like, it's a very difficult task. Uh, however, we need to show ourselves, you know, we, we need to pretend that we know how to perform this super I. But so I think what aesthetics allow is a small room to relax or to, you know, put that super eye, you know, that kind of tank build kind of enclosed thing that you have to build in, you know, in this reality, you can like put it out there and maybe open it a bit and to deal with it in a playful ways, you know, so, so you can share, you know, some of the aspects that constitutes this conceptual psychological tank that we have built, you know. And by constantly um, trying to be playful with this tank and to dismantling or seeing how problematic it is or seeing its, you know, its breaking points, uh, that I think opens a kind of warm, you know, a kind of, a, a kind of worms in the sense that then we see that actually that super eye is actually a much more porous, you know, mm. unstable, fragile, uh, thing that is constantly at the verge of collapsing and and sometimes very often also collapsing, you know, because we cannot hold it. It's just, it's, it's, it's a, a, an impossibility, you know. So what I propose is playful forms of estrangement in order to deal with this structural alienation. So, you know, not that we eat it by ourselves, like thinking, oh, am I so, I feel so, you know, like, oh, what's wrong with me? You know, what, how can, why cannot cope? Why cannot do this? You know, why feel so, 
you know, lack of confidence. Why things are so heavy? Why do I pretend to be so cool when I'm not feeling cool? Why to, you know, all this kind mm. of negative feelings that we often, you know, just personalize it and think that is our own problem. You know, it's, well, it's actually, there, there are structural reasons for, for this to happen. And, and maybe if we collectivize this uneasiness, uneasiness or this not well-being, this, you know, then there will be maybe the possibility of saying like, well, this is not good. This is not good. <laughs> we need to develop something better. We need to do something about it, you know, and that might be like, you know, if you're thinking just by yourself that, it feels like, what am I going to do? You know, like what, you know. But if there are many people who think like, okay, you know, it, if it is less intimidated, the intimidating process, you know, it is like, hmm. well, is it, I don't know if it happened to you, but it certainly happened to me, actually, in Sweden. That, you know, I, I thought like, oh, there's a problem with me. I'm, there's something wrong with me. You know, I'm not able to, you know, engage in this society mm. in a proper way. You know, it's like, it's, it must be me. It must be me. It must be me. By this, by today, I don't think it's me. You know, it was not, you know, after five years of yeah, living there. Sweet, Sweden does this to you. I know. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, no, it's not me. It's not, you know, then you talk to other people. And it's like, it's not me. You know, there is something, you know, not quite. Well, I, I, and that, in fact, I lived in Sweden for five years, and Sweden is one of the most individualist countries in the world, yeah. if not the most, even though it has that social democratic past. But maybe this also comes from my engagement in living in Sweden, not that kind of mm. strong forms of individualism that, you know, at the end of the day, they might make you feel alienated, you know. Yeah. Um. You, you, you describe this moment of, of what in the book you call a catastrophic reaction. This is the moment where this inability to connect to the I is, is such that the individual can no longer cope. And of course, the, the concept, the whole theorization and this forced estrangement that you propose is a method of collectively revealing this. But I do also want to, to give some, some credit to... Um, the second half of the book, of the rather the second half of the theoretical part of the book, in which you you move a little bit away from the Marxist framework, which offers this um, structural explanation for, for alienation, and I think you know your your, your argument for I follow that argument quite quite closely, and I think I'm agreement in agreement with you that subsequent guises of capitalism and particularly our, our kind of late stage neoliberalisms on its last legs definitely does still manage to perform alienation par excellence like 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 even even in situations like your like your concerts which is destabilizing to people it is very difficult to achieve the kind of breakthrough the realization the that catastrophic reaction even there is very very well we are very 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 well safely mediated away from it but the second part of, of the book, what you do is you look at a more kind of psychological realm. Um, I'm desperately trying to look at my notes and find a phrase that a reviewer of your book used. But you talk about, you, you list in a way that, that almost amused me before I understood the, the severity of it all. You list all sorts of acronyms for um, psychological pathologizations of the self. Um, you know, I've just just looking looking at some of them. I have DBDR, D, DPDR, the personalization derealization disorder, um, and a couple of pages on. And I'm afraid I haven't highlighted them to be able to to really. I know I have. We have things like eusamusia. We have agnesia. We have Fagoli delusions. Capricorn syndrome, which is the correct name or rather the scientific name for imposter syndrome. So you take us through this whole catalog of, of acronyms and, and slightly slightly technical names for, for things that we all experience on a daily basis. 
And you propose, and I think this is uncontroversial, you propose that the biological organism has to defend itself from, um, from having to deal with all the possible stimuli and information that we are bombarded with on a daily basis. And this is, this is also something that contributes to, to alienation. So I, I, want, I want you to, to develop a little bit the, the, the space in which we don't have to go all the way to Marx and his structural explanation to, to understand that alienation is a real thing from which we might want to, might want to um, break out. Um, yeah, well, that's a kind of, um, yeah, that's what I call alienation from below, which generates um, a phantom subjectivity. Mm. And this is another expression for, you know, what social dissonance is collapsing the self and the individual with subjectivity, believing that we as individuals are already a subject, but also mm. the self with the individual, you know, so to kind of naturalize selfhood as if it was contained within the bodies that we have. This is a form of social distance, which is a kind of uh, symptom of, uh, of, of, a, of a form of alienation but that it tries to actually contain it. So, you know, so basically what the help of Thomas Metzinger, this philosopher of mine who has looked at several of, the, you know, many of these pathologies uh, that you mentioned, like for example, the Cotard syndrome, when somebody thinks he's dying. So this is occurring because the illusion that produces selfhood, or let's say, you know, what he considers to be selfhood through the theory model of subjectivity, what he considers, calls the self-model theory of subjectivity, is an illusion that our brain produces in order to reduce the neurocomputational cost of our brains. And this illusion sometimes is not working. Sometimes it's, you know, it can be you know, uh, it can be def faulty, it can be, you know, through an accident, then your brain stops producing that illusion. So that's what happens, for example, with this Cotard syndrome, which is when somebody thinks that is dead or that is dying or that is rotting. So there, mm -hmm. that illusion of the self is not being able to be produced. There is nothing there to be... So this totally counters that uh, perspective in which... The individual and self is already one, you know, that is attached only to your body, you know. And I think forms of virtual reality and, you know, avatars, you know, and are really pushing this and we will see, you know, this will become obvious through technology, you know, very soon. Yeah. And then with the metaverse, you know, like that separation from our body, you know, that's, I think, in process of happening. But, like, we have come from a time in which that close relation between selfhood and the body, you know, that has, you know, ha, ha, we, we have lived with it. And, you know, through that liberal and especially neoliberal thought in which it makes you believe that you're already a subject with capacity for acting for self-determining, you know, or, or, you know, for freedom. Uh, however, then this in your everyday life, you know, you're not free from buying, you, you, you need to pay when you, you buy things, you know, when you want things, you know, so <laughs> it's a very twisted, distorted conception yeah. of freedom. But like, so this is the kind of template that we have built in which the values that we think are good democracy, equality, you know, all these values, you know, individual freedom, we think they're good, you know, it's like, it, they are based on extremely, you know, let's say fallacies. They're, you know, they're just like yeah. based on things that are not materially, at the material level, real. There is, they are, you know, they are, you know, ideological constructions. And we've seen more and more this uh, mismatch, and you know that is, is not 
surprising that there is so much mental health problems rising because that kind of ideal of the individual is almost what well, is crumbling, but is um, is not able to hold itself or you know or then what you said you had these responses you know with the uh, dead of the welfare state you have these responses in which you are in the jungle you know and then it's like mm. up to you what you do so then there is all this libertarian you know kind of like positions rising and like saying like no no i can do you know like i'm gonna just with money you know it gives you a certain amount of agency i'm just gonna go for it and fuck the rest you know but you know with climate change and many things that you know that it's not gonna well it, it might last for you for a bit and it might make you happy for a bit but like you know this is in the long run is a uh, i don't know if it's a good solution but like yeah so that's what i'm trying i'm trying to undermine some of those assumptions that holds you know uh the idea of subjectivity that we hold in liberal societies okay so i think i think this is quite a clear formulation of, of something that i'm i'm beginning to see and you know both the left and the right wing politics beginning to actually find consensus on is that the neoliberal subject is now become an impossibility and one can analyze this and, and diagnose this from from many positions um and and you, you you know you're not the first thinker on the left that I've spoken to 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 recently who actually sees that that certain liberal values defined by by the kind of performance of politics that we see in the news cycle every day are actually deeply problematic for our continuation as societies, if not even as a species. Um, I kind of hate to do this, but let's do this. So let let's 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 round up maybe by trying to do two things. One is to think about the the possible vision of what happens after we, we've gained the consciousness that you were talking about. You, you're still a Marxist to a certain extent. You, you do try to destroy false consciousness and maybe replace it with something else. I don't necessarily see you that your project requires us to kind of completely understand where you are, but you want to find ways of externalizing um, alienation in one way or another. Um, and then if we could make it somehow jolly at the end, because, you know, everybody loves a happy ending, maybe we could find a way to play in a clip of music, as we had discussed before we started <laughs> started recording. So, so yes, please, some, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, your, your vision of the, rev the future and, and some music to play us out, Martin, if we could. I think we can do both at the same time. I'll try to sing the potential of a future where we feel that things are possible. What can be done after we become conscious of our social dishonor? We will begin to understand that we are not so alone in our feelings of despair. In our resentment with the world, we could build a revolutionary community that get hold of those people who keep things the way they are. Well, thank you. That was worth waiting five years for.
Social Dissonance by Matin is published by Urbanomic. I'm Pierre Valencer, and the editor is Marshall Poe. Thanks for listening, and join us next time. Thank you.